Welcome to Snowden Media Access Corporation's Community Forum Show. My name is Steve Kelly, I'll be your host today. And today, I have a distinct pleasure in introducing you to John Lott. John is here to share his campaign uh, to become one of our 40 state senators here in Massachusetts. So welcome to the show, John. Thank you for having me, Stephen. All right, so um, you're a young guy, uh, 24 years old. That's right. Raring to go. Oh yeah. Right. Um, maybe injecting some uh, youth vigor and things that uh, are really needed to change, to make change. Um, tell us about what has put you to this place where you want to run for state senator. It's it's a big position. What's going to qualify you? Um, all those kinds of things. Okay. Great. So we'll start wa well, with what? Why am I running? So. Um, I believe that in Massachusetts, the two-party system in, in, in America, the two-party system has failed us. In Massachusetts, most of the time, it's just the one-party system. Over half of state Senate elections every year are uncontested Democrats running, and, and almost two-thirds of every state House candidate is a Democrat running uncontested. I'm an independent. I don't, I, I don't like the two-party system. I think it needs to be done away with, basically. I think it's anti-intellectual, and there, I, it's fraught with all sorts of problems. So I'm running as an independent because I want to kind of I want to change that, and especially in today, I think we're living in probably the most polarized political time in in existing memory. So I want to I want to be a bridge between both sides, which are are veering away from each other. So I'm I'm a lifelong resident of Stoughton. I was born here. I've been raised here. Uh, I went to the Jones School. Uh, I'm a town meeting rep right now, so I got to vote for the new high school, which was great. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm still a pretty young guy. Hopefully, I'm bringing a fresh perspective on a, a stale system. So um, with that kind of message, you're going to sort of encounter some pushback, right, from um, people that are incumbents. Um, how do you think you might um, sort of handle that and still be able to get things done? Well, one of the good things about being an, an independent is that you're not beholden to any party bosses. I don't care what. Bruce Tarr or Mr. Rosenberg has. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be pressured by somebody who is outside of my, my political affiliation, which is independent. The only people that I really want to take orders from are my constituents, the people who I hope will represent me or vote for me in November. Um, and I think being an independent, you sort of have. You have an advantage in that. Neither side is predisposed against you from the very start. Right. So hopefully that just ha just having an independent elected, I think, w would create waves through the Massachusetts political system. All right. So one thing I will share that I think is a real positive for you, um, you have this very unique position at the present time in that there is not a Republican running. You are the only independent running. There are two Democrats vying for the Democratic seat, which that means you are right now the only person who's guaranteed to have their name on the ballot. That's right. I am the only one who you know right now is going to be on the ballot on November 8th. Now, I also want to share with the audience a confession of sorts for me. Sure. Um, your mom and your dad are very dear to me. Thank I you. I have to suggest me that. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but they've, they've um, done a great job in their lives. Your mom runs the Tanzanian Foundation for Children. Tanzania School Foundation. School Foundation. Dot uh, org. Yeah, for children. <laughs> yeah, dot org. And, um, and, and she's just devoted herself to helping people in Africa, um, Tanzania in particular. And I just adore that. I think that she's doing something that um, is above and beyond what most people can even think about. And your dad is this hardworking guy. He, uh, he does glass block installations. And then he also does furniture installs. That's um, right. So he's really a down to earth guy. Um, you're coming from the salt of the earth, in, in, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. So, um, so that's a bit of a confession to share with the audience. Uh, I'd like to see you succeed. Um, I hope you. you'll uh, have a perspective that helps all of us go forward. And then uh, another thing I want to sort of admit to is, and I don't know if the audience would see it as I do, but I think that my generation has done a less good job than we should have. We're actually handing over the reins to the younger generation of this system that seems to not be in as good a shape as the way we came into it. And what, what do you think of that? I do think, well, 
America is still the, the country with the most opportunity in the world. And I don't want to blame any particular age group or political organization or, or faction or anything for that. I think it definitely, it, it does seem a lot more cynical today than it did when you were growing up. There, you couldn't, you couldn't, or maybe you could, but most people couldn't gra just graduate high school and get a great job and then in, in six years pay for a home and, and raise a family. You, you absolutely could not do that in America today. Um, and it's a, a really complex issue to unpack. Um, so I, I don't want, I'm not going to blame any particular individuals or, or age groups or movements or whatever for that, but okay. I see where you're coming from. Yeah, no, I just feel like we haven't done as good a job as was done for us. Um, you know, the greatest generation of all time sort of gave us forward, uh, my generation, a great stepping stone. And um, I think we're just, we, we haven't answered that call. And maybe it's up to a generation like yours to come in and say, you have to redouble your efforts and maybe be less, and I'm putting words in the mouths of other people, uh, less selfish than we have been. And some people would say, hey, we haven't been selfish. We've extended um, the good graces of the United States throughout the world. But there just seems to be, uh, one of the greatest threats has gotten worse, I think, and that's terrorism, and I think it's due to the randomness of um, of its calling, the, the idea of terrorism. So, what do you think? Uh, let's let's okay. run off of that with what's the most pressing issue in the campaign that you're going to run? What do you, what are you answering to as you run your campaign? Okay. Well, let me just say first that I I think that I, I don't worry about terrorism, and we are living in the, the safest time in human history to be alive. I've never worried about going to a mall and having my life in danger. But I think, so the most important issue in this campaign and facing Massachusetts right now, I think is the opioid epidemic, particularly like painkillers, heroin, fentanyl, drugs like this, the overdoses, there are more and more every year where we are at the point where over four people on average die. I hate talking about people like, a, like there's just statistics, but this problem has gotten out of control and people for the last five years have been doing very little about it because we'd rather just turn away and just kind of ignore it. Okay, so you, your number one issue then will be opioids. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Give me numbers two and three then. What, what else is, Okay. What, what else do you see your platform working toward? Okay, so there are a lot of issues on my platform, <clears throat> but if I had to pick just a few of them, so I used to be a high school teacher. I taught Latin at a few schools in Connecticut and Massachusetts. I also ran for the school board in Stowe unsuccessfully. So education is up there, even though Massachusetts does have the, the best schools in the nation and some of the best in, in the entire world. Um, and also I would say controlling the cost of living, especially rent prices and house, housing prices, which are, they're just, they're going up and up and people can't afford them. So you, you say you're an independent, but that's sort of a democratic side to things is the idea of controlling rent and things like that. Well, when we talk about affordable housing, I think that it, it, it means a lot of different things. It, it does mean some rent control, but it also means loosening some zoning laws and deregulating part of the housing market in order to spur developers to create more housing, micro apartments, condos, you know, starter homes, to get more housing out there in order to, lo to, to lower the price by increasing the supply. I want to pick up on something you said about um, you ran for school committee unsuccessfully, yep. right? And you're right back at it again. I love to see that in a person where Thank they you. say, look, you know, failure's not going to stop me. Who, I don't know, who's that, who does that sound like to you? <laughs> failure's not going to stop me. Who does that sound like? It yeah. sounds like America, um, although we've had so much success. Um, well, I don't know if you're talking, trying to allude to my mother. Um, no, just or, anybody. In, and where did you get this idea that... You know, you're just not going to be held back well, by failure. You know, I, so you know, I, I definitely do want to win. I think I, I can win. I'm run, trying to run a winning campaign. The odds are stacked probably against me because I haven't fundraised over $100,000. I would rather lose a campaign as myself than win it and be after becoming somebody else. So, you know, I, I would rather give it my all and, and be the person that I want to be like I was at the school committee hearing, which you can probably find on SMAC, um, and lose, that's fine. 
I, ha I have no problems. I have no regrets with the way that I, I ran my, my little you know, stint for, for school committee. I became a town meeting rep at the election after that. So it's not like I, I don't give up after I, after I lose. So let's talk a little bit about campaigning. And I think um, perhaps uh, Jackie, um, who's helping in the back with Gina, they could put up your uh, information. And I see it sure. behind us as well. So let me just read it for everybody. It's John Lott. And it's going to be Jonathan when you see it on the ballot, yep. L-O-T-T. And the phone number to reach John, 857-302-0639. That goes right to my cell phone. And so you can get a hold of Jonathan and you can, uh, you know, lodge some ideas with him. And the email is L-O-T-T 2016 at gmail.com. And the Facebook is facebook.com slash vote John Lott. And we have a Twitter account as well, at Mr. John Lott. And uh, so I actually, I, I forgot when I was checking this graphic. So my website is, act, is also lott2016.com, which is in the, the uh, poster between us. So January 1, 2017, what are we going to do with that email? Oh, we're going to change it. <laughs> um, <laughs> have to go to lott The, lot the phone number won't change, but the website and the email will change. I'll get an official, you know, it'll be Jonathan underscore lot at mass.gov or whatever it is. But. Yeah. Wow. So um, tell us more about what's driving you. Because, I, I mean, there are a lot of guys 24 years old. Very few of them have taken the time to go out and get the signatures and uh, make a decision to go forward like this. Okay. So... I heard a quote a few months ago that I thought was, it was just brilliant. It said that if your, your why is big enough, your how doesn't matter. So I'm really driven by the issues in this campaign, especially the opioid epidemic. And I think that, especially today, people always say, we need to get young people involved in politics. We need, you know, everybody says, we, need, we, need, we want young people to get involved. But then when they actually get involved, then they say, oh, no, we didn't actually want you to get involved. I actually want to get involved. This is why I'm running. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a good time in my life to run. 2016 is the year of the independent. It's the year of the anti-incumbent, anti-establishment candidate. It's an open seat. So this is the greatest opportunity that someone like me has, until I'm you know, much older, I think, to actually get my foot in the door and get some real change happening. Well, I like that. If the why is big enough, the how will take care of itself. Yeah, maybe. I'll, I'll paraphrase sure. that. All right. So uh, where else does this, is this district that you're going to be running for? What, what other parts of it? You have a part in Stoughton. Yeah, well, it's all what of Stoughton. So, all of Stoughton. So it's all of the, the following towns and then part of some that I'll name afterwards. So it's all of Avon, Canton, Stoughton, Milton, Randolph, and West Bridgewater. It's part of Braintree, Easton, East Bridgewater and Sharon. Wow. Yep. So there are about 170,000 people living in that area, and there will be about 66,000 who vote in the state Senate election. So they're anticipating 66,000 voters. That's my, that's my personal When is voting day? Is it November 4th? November 8th. It's November a Tuesday. 8th. It's a Tuesday. So you have, uh, we have uh, August, September, October. So pretty much three and a half months to get moving. Yep. All right. Do you have any debates um, scheduled, uh, or is it too early because Timothy and Nora um, are you know, in between? I'm so glad you asked, because about an hour before I came here, there were, I read a Stoughton Patch article, and a Can it's also a Canton Patch, that said that, that Nora Harrington had challenged Walter Timothy to a series of debates. I had not received any such invitation. So I don't know if I'm going to get to be invited as part of those debates. Um, I certainly would like to. Perhaps you could extend an invitation to a debate. Well, I would love to. Um, but I think it's, I don't think either of them wants to even acknowledge me at this point. Um, after the, the primary is over, whoever, you know, I'm facing, I would, we got to have a debate. There's got to be some kind of public confrontation of ideas. That just has to happen. Um, so hopefully we'll get that going. All right. So I think we have to extend out your platform for you to either draw people in or push people away. Okay. And hopefully draw more in. Of course. Um, what other issues do you see um, besides opioids? And, and even more important to me, at least, um, I'm going to um, respectfully disagree with you and suggest that the most important issue that we're facing is today the economy. Is, is terrorism. The okay. second most important, in my view, is the 
um, sort of the, the economy as it relates to creating opportunities and creating value, um, control of government spending, and then fourth, I would put opioids so that it's still in okay. a place that needs a strong representation, but that I sort of change it. So how, how do you respond to somebody like me and, and say, well, you're crazy. Opioids are number one, and then let me tell you why. Okay, so, well, I would say, if we look at terrorism, can you name anything that the Massachusetts government has done in order to stop terrorism? It seems like a, a federal, a federal you know, effort that they're leading. Um, for opioids, I would say, or so, until I ran, I, I hadn't known anybody who that knowingly ha had done you know, any kind of prescription pain, you know, painkillers or heroin or anything like that. And I don't know if you have, but, but after I started running, I met a few parents of people who had overdosed and who, or who, who were, were you know, addicts or, or whatever. This isn't an issue that I want to wait until I know somebody who's been affected by it before we get that under control. So that's what I say about, about opioid epidemic. Um, you talk about controlling government spending. I absolutely agree. This is, people call it tax Massachusetts. Um, Massachusetts has a, there, there's waste. There's a waste, there's waste in every government. I'd love to find that waste. I'd love to cut it out. Um, that's why I've, I've proposed, and I will propose if I get elected, a, a, a one year, at least one year, salary freeze on all public employees making $100,000 a year or more. So that, you know, tax revenue keeps going up. If we can just freeze some of the, these outrageous salaries for people in the T or, or other, you know, areas that they're just making, frankly, too much money at the expense of taxpayers, then I think we can, we can start to kind of evaluate this problem a little more seriously. Do you know, and it's unclear to me, whether or not you have, as a state senator, ha can exert any influence on the T? It's not clear to me that that's not an independent organization. I'm not sure. Well, it is a, it's a Massachusetts organization. I'm not sure to the extent that a state senator can do that, but I think a lot of it has to do, in, in, or I think Governor Baker has the most to say about that. But when we talk about you know, funding bills or something, now the, the Senate is not allowed to introduce any bills that allocate spending. That has to be done through the State House, um, the, House the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Um, but I think also it, it comes in a affecting salaries, and for example, the T, which is a, a disaster. Um, it comes from a, like when you have a position, you have a bigger voice. People care more about what you say, you have more influence. And I want to use that kind of influence as well, even if it's not necessarily making a law, writing the bill to affect public opinion and kind of shift the, the discussion over public salaries. Um, have you studied, um, say, Brian Joyce's career for what he has accomplished? I don't know what he did before he was a senator. He's probably a lawyer. Um, I looked at, at all the public records of him, you know, e each of these elections as I kind of wanted to, to gauge how many of the, these people are going to vote Democrat no matter what. How many are, do I expect to vote in 2016? Um, I, I noticed that he ran for the House of Representatives unsuccessfully in 2001. Um, I've, I've looked at, at that, but I haven't like scrutinized it. I haven't been digging up old articles about him. Um, I, I don't want to make this election about Brian Joyce. I, I know it was like, that question wasn't my intent to do that. My intent was that uh, to kind of gauge what can a senator get done. So okay. if you look at the seat that you're looking to occupy, what's been done over the last 10 years through that seat, as opposed to uh, naming the name. Uh, so I apologize, I misdirected the question, okay. but. It's more about like what can a senator get done, and, and what do you see yourself getting done, based on having seen what senators get done. Okay, well, that's a good question, and I think what Brian Joyce got done, or what any kind of you know party senator and Democratic senator gets done in Massachusetts, is very different from what a Republican senator can get done in Massachusetts, and both of those are probably quite different from what an independent senator can get done in Massachusetts. Um, I don't know exactly what I will be able to get done until I actually get in there and start building relationships with these other senators and lawmakers and their aides and uh, all these different people that have influence there. Um, I would be happy if in my first two years I could get needle exchanges at a lot more places in Massachusetts 
and bring Gloucester's angel plan to a lot more towns in Massachusetts. If we just, if we just accomplish those two things, I would feel good about it. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit more about yourself now. I want to kind of backtrack from what we've got right into some things you want to do. But uh, tell us about your education, what, you know, what, how your okay. education has readied you for this foray into, public, uh, into okay. the public eye. All right, so we'll, we'll start with my education at the beginning. So I was the last graduating class of the, the E.A. Jones School in Stoughton before it closed. Uh, I went to Catholic Memorial from 7th grade to 12th grade, grade school. Um, and then I went to the University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, from 2010 to 2014. I double majored in English and classical civilization. And I double minored in Latin and film and television studies. Um, so after that, I want, basically since high school, I wanted to be a high school teacher. And I went through high school thinking that. I went through college thinking that. And then I became a, a Latin teacher in Connecticut the year, the, the fall after I graduated. And then it, it didn't hold the same kind of glow that it did in my mind. Um, and then, so after that year, feeling like I, I basically had to be a teacher, even though it, wa it, was, it wasn't you know, the thing that I wanted to do. I was a teacher again. I was a sub, sub in Stoughton and a few other places. And then I was a long-term sub in, in Needham High School, still all doing Latin, unless, except when I was a day sub. And then I had been thinking since my time in Connecticut that maybe I wanted to get involved in politics. That's sort of what led me to run for school board in Stoughton in November, maybe it was October. And then when Brian Joyce, you know, there was a whole, the whole scandal with him and then he said he wasn't gonna run for reelection, I thought, well, this is an opportunity now that, you know, with my background as a teacher, with my background as a young person, a lifelong resident of Stoughton, and with an open seat, more, most importantly, that I might be able to make the jump from teacher to lawmaker. Wow, okay. So what, um, if you were to look at the kind of um, courses you took, what would be the thing that says this course helped me the most? In regards to running for office? Yeah. He said okay. classic civilization. Yeah, you, 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 just... we could talk about the way that, you know, that my study of Roman history and, and, and politics influenced me, but I, I, and this is not an indictment against the university system, but I think the most learning I did in college was outside of the classroom. It was it was in it is in meeting people and 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 learning how to deal with certain. I was in the student government, which was which is an, at most universities a joke. Um, but like learning how to, to navigate some petty personalities and then some administrators and and just it, it's you know it's hard to say like looking back on college, if you're picking a certain class, like a poetry class, what did I learn in that poetry class? Well, yeah. <laughs> if I could tell you what I learned in the poetry class in two minutes, then you wouldn't have to go to the class. A lot of the learning, it's, it's internalized, and it's so hard to kind of tell people what you learned from it. Yes. So let me switch a little bit. Sure. Um, could you think about, for me, what leadership means to you? And almost to the point of define leadership for us. Okay. I think leadership means realizing that you have to make tough and unpopular decisions in the face of adversity and still going ahead and doing it. A leader has to be someone who is respected, who is who's followed. They don't have to be someone who's loved. They shouldn't be someone who's feared, but they should be someone that, that you say, all right, we are in a tough situation. We are not sure what to do. We trust your guidance. We trust your, your ability. We are following you. What do you want to do? Okay, so that and that's what you intend to be, sort of positionally. Well, hopefully, I don't have to make a whole lot of tough decisions. Um, but the fact is, anytime you make a vote, there are going to be thousands of people in the district who wish that you had made the other, the opposite vote. So, it, in Massachusetts, especially with the one you know the, the one party system or the demo, you know, any, anytime a Democrat makes. A, a vote that's just on the party line, there are going to be Republicans who are upset. And these same Republicans are going to be upset all the time because the Democrats are making the same vote all the time. And for the Republicans in Massachusetts, most of the time they're voting the way the Republicans want. There's a lot more bipartisanship, I think, with the Republicans in Massachusetts than the Democrats, even though I lean more Democratic. As an independent, I, I expect that I will be 
voting more with the Democrats, but I want to give the Republicans their fair say too. They ha have a, just as much a right, you know, to be part of this political system as anyone else. So, if you had a change of heart and ran as a Republican, I would not. You just would not. I would not. Uh, I I would not vote run as a Democrat either. I briefly, brief, so briefly, toyed with the idea of running as a United Independent Party candidate. Okay. But, so the way that you get on the ballot in Massachusetts, if you are a, a party candidate, you have to get signatures from your party. Maybe you can get independents too, I'm not sure. But you can't, if any, any Democrat signatures you get, Republican ones, they don't count. As an independent, you can get anybody. Anybody can sign your papers. As a United Independent Party candidate, which I'm not, but you could not get the Democrats or the Republicans. And that means that I would probably have to get a thousand signatures. And that was a, just a, it was just a daunting amount of work. I, so, I mean, how many signatures did you need to get? You needed to get 300 certified. And they recommended that you get 600 because some of them are gonna be illegitimate or they're just not gonna work. I ended up getting, I believe, 563. And then of those, 501 were certified. Wow. And I got almost all of them myself. And how did you do that? Tell us about that. I would stand in uh, public places with my clipboard and a pen, and people would be walking by, and I'd say, are you a registered voter? And then some right. of them would just ignore me, and then some of them would say yes, and I'd say, my name is John Lott. I'm running for Massachusetts State Senate, and I need 300 signatures to get on the ballot. Would you mind writing your name? And then... And, and you just did it, and you kept it. I just did it, yep. Now, how many days did it take? Ooh. Well, I, so I declared on April 6th, which was a Thursday, I think, and it, you needed to have them all done and do and all that by May 3rd. Wow. So you had so I less did it, than a month. I did a little less than a month. Yep. Terrific. Terrific. So tell us about your platform for making business successful and prosperity in the Commonwealth. Okay. All right. Thank you. So as a, as a business owner, I'm sure this is an issue that's very dear to you. Very dear. Um, well. At a certain point, so I am opposed to raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I, I, I think, so a spoiler, uh, last Saturday I was laid off from my job in Canton. I was only working there for a few weeks, not a big deal, but I was laid off. I was making $14 an hour. I was laid off because my employer could not afford to keep paying all of his employees the wage that they wanted, that, that he was paying them. So there were a few other people who were laid off as well. And I think that we, that this is one of the reasons why we need to oppose a, a minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour. Even I know I like, I like Bernie, but I think that was just it was a bad position to take. And that if you raise the minimum wage too high, then business is gonna it's gonna feel crushed. It's gonna feel burned. They're gonna have to let people go, and now there are no jobs for for those people. It can't be too low, and, but there there is a balance. Workers should be able to to you know fight for a higher wage, but not have it be a state mandated one. In regards to spurring new business opportunities, this is something that a lot of people say, oh, we're, um, we're gonna be great for business, but then they actually, when it comes time, the, you know, the ideas that they have, they're not, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't amount to anything. So I'm not gonna say that my ideas are going to, you know, it's gonna explode business, um, but I'm not, it's not gonna hurt business, hopefully, either, but so I, I want to work with business leaders like yourself, but you know, people of your of your stature and importance, and actually talk to them about how we're going to get you know more businesses to come to, to Massachusetts. You know, GE we gave them such a huge tax credit just to get the jobs, but the tax credit wasn't probably it wasn't worth the jobs to most Massachusetts people. There's a smart time to use to incentivize business, businesses with tax credits, and there's also a, a you know an unwise time to do it. Um, I think we can really get solar industries, even more of them in Massachusetts, by drastically raising or removing entirely the net metering cap, and we can really spur more, more solar power. That would be great, clean, relatively high wage jobs in the state. So you alluded to the presidential election when you mentioned Bernie. Where do you stand? <laughs> oh man. there. I, I will not vote for Donald Trump. I will not vote for Hillary Clinton. If you make me choose, I pick the bullet. Um, I, I would have I would have voted for Bernie, even though I disagree with some of his economic policies. I would have loved to have him for president. 
I also would have loved to have Rand Paul for president. Um, so there's one on each side, neither of them won, unfortunately. They're just, Trump, Donald Trump is he's a lunatic. He, most of the things he says he doesn't mean, I think. And Hillary comes off as one of the most inauthentic people I've ever seen, frankly. I will probably be voting for Gary Johnson, the libertarian candidate. I'm not a libertarian, but I probably will vote for him in 2016. Now, if I were um, sort of a political consultant, I would have said to you, you shouldn't have like trashed Donald Trump. You shouldn't have trashed Cl uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, tell us, like, do you think that, tell us why speaking your mind is better than listening to a, what a potential consultant would have told you. Well, so many people, they, 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 politicians or people who are running for office, they don't want to take a stance on anything. They just, they don't want to, any time that they say, oh, well, you know, we're going to look at that very closely, but I can't tell you what I'm going to do yet, that doesn't inspire confidence in me that they, that they are willing to say, I'm not telling you what I'm, what I'm going to do. I want to be authentic. I'm, I want to be a straightforward person. You might not agree with what, I, with what I say, but hopefully you respect that I have the directness and the honesty to actually say it. And that's one of the great things about being an independent is that I can say, oh, Donald Trump is a madman. Hillary Clinton is... I just don't, you know, I, untrustworthy. Inauthentic yeah. or untrustworthy, like, as you've said. There aren't going to be, you know, Republicans and Democrats who are disavowing my statements because I'm not expecting them to support my candidacy anyway. How do you think we came to this point where we have the two leading Oof. candidates to um, have the most influence in our country are, by your own description, uh, a madman and an inauthentic person? How did that happen? Oh man, you know, we could unpack this for an hour. I, I would love to. Um, and I, oh man, it, I, no, this is one of those times where I don't actually don't want to be too direct because it, you know, it would really be, you know, not flattering to either party. Um, so, and, and if I could just interrupt. I realize I've asked you a big mouthful question. It's not an easy question to say, how did both parties get to a place where they've got uh, so much uh, more negatives than positive with each party in terms of voting? Yeah. In other words, more people don't like each candidate, even within their own parties, than do like each candidate. Yeah. So it, how, how do we get there? I mean, what, what went wrong? Besides what I said earlier about our generation is not... Um, we'd like to think of ourselves as put together, but um, it's unclear to me that we can make that stand. Unfortunately, it, 2016, or for the president anyway, it's an election motivated by hate and spite. Um, hate from the Republican, or hate from the, boy, both sides really, hate, spite, fear. I think a lot of it has to, to do with the Democrats, some of them, the leadership was moved, was, it was trying to enact too much social progress too quickly, and the rest of, the, of America couldn't keep up or didn't want to. And then bal the ballooning debt and some of the Republican pushback, some of it legitimate, a lot of it anti-scientific. Give us an example, anti-scientific. All right, you look at climate change for the Republicans. Climate change is real. It's a real problem. It's man-made. And yet, big oil and big energy is, has buy, is basically purchasing Republican congressmen who are, like when, the, when Jim Inhofe, the, the, the chairman of, I think it was the Committee on, on the Environment, took out a snowball on the House floor and said, climate change isn't real, I have a snowball. Like, that was, that was ludicrous. And there were people who were indoctrinated by, they trusted their leaders too much. And then when their leaders' words were put in by corporations who were buying them, they actually they started to believe things that he said. And then the growing division, the splitting of, of both parties apart from each other meant that these people had to pick a side. And they couldn't, out of fear of being seen as someone who flipped or who changed their mind, they had to stick with these people these, on their trains to the end of the line. And where both of those trains end is not a pretty place. Let me switch gears a little bit with you. If you had a mentor in your life, who would it be? You mean, who was my mentor, or if I could pick a mentor? Let's go both. Who was your mentor, and then if you could pick one, who would you have be a mentor? 
You know, I'm not sure I had a mentor, um, honestly. Parents, for sure. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, my parents, brilliant people. Bruce and Christine Lott did a great job raising me and my siblings, but they, they did not, and this is to their great credit, they did not push their political beliefs on me growing up. Um, but they weren't my mentor in the sense that like, they were really like coaching me and like providing me with all sorts of you know, valuable career advice. Um, although they were, you know, I'm sure they are very smart in, their own, in that way. Um, if I could pick a mentor to have, are we talking political or just like anything? It's your show. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll come back to you on that one. I'll think about it when we're doing the. Uh, yeah, well, we, we'll take a little break yeah. a little later. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's define the independent party. Okay. Tell us if it was in your power to define it, what would it be? Well, the independents don't have a party. And I would say that we are, well, we're defined by people who want to think for ourselves. I met a woman in Randolph when I was collecting signatures. She said, I always vote Democratic Party. I said, why? And she said, that's what, that's what I do. That's what, we, that's, what we, that's what we do. And I said, all right, well, tell me two things the Democratic Party stands for. And she couldn't tell me. I said, all right, OK, just tell me one thing. What makes Democrats different from the Republicans? She said, I don't know, but they're better. Independents, as far as I see it, are people who realize that the, the two parties they're just people who tell you, vote this way. And the people vote this straight party ticket. That's not what I want to be. An independent is someone who actually looks at the ideas and the candidates and the personalities and thinks for themselves rather than just voting all the Democrats or all the Republicans. That's one of the reasons that, that politics is so divisive, because people, they don't, they don't want to think for themselves. They just want to be told, vote Democrat, vote Republican. All right. Um, again, I'm going to move us to another place. Um, I'm troubled that you don't see terrorism as high a priority as I do. Um, technology has catapulted terrorism forward to a, a position of strength that I think it couldn't have had before social media, before instant messaging, uh, before like hidden uh, messaging that can be done through everything from a video game to uh, regular no online yep. uh, communication. Um, I'm I'm wondering like how how you might change my mind about that position you've taken. Okay, well, if you care to, there's no doubt that the face of terrorism and the way, the technologies and, and and methods they use is evolving. You know, Instagram, Twitter, they these have been the biggest ways that ISIS is getting more recruit, you know, more followers. And there definitely needs to be a, a strong cyber counterterrorism initiative used by the government. We, they are doing it right now. And ISIS, I believe, is on the decline. But it's so hard to kill an actual idea. I think that if you just think about it, we are like, this is the safest time to be alive. It has never been better to be an American, even though it feels like things might be getting worse for some people. I don't do you, I mean, I don't, do you go to places, to the train stations, and, and, and look around and say, oh, is there someone with a, could there some, be someone with a bomb here? Yes. I, I, don't, I, I do look much more carefully than ever before, and I kind of would cue you into, like, what you're saying about safe. Talk to those 48 people that were killed in the Florida incident. Uh, talk to those police officers' wives and families who were just killed randomly responding, and it wasn't quite random, it was a targeted attack, but it wasn't a specific police officer. It was, we're gonna kill, or I'm gonna kill police officers. It doesn't matter which one comes into my eye, I'm gonna kill them. And if you talk to those families, I think they're gonna suggest to you that um, the terrorism's real and it's not so safe. So um, I'm afraid for schools, for instance, uh, that, we, that we need to harden schools more than ever before. How do you want to, how, how are you going to harden them? Uh, no one gets in without a, um, a passcode card, period. And you have to go through some sort of lockdown situation just to get into the school. I don't want people in those schools. The children are our most vulnerable asset and uh, soft targets are what uh, these new terrorism groups are about. They seem to have um, less respect for life, less respect for others. 
than, um, than many past threats that we've, we've, we've faced as a country. Well, I think, all right, so if you have a, a school, for example, let's say, show me your past before you get in. The terrorists, is, is just going to kill them and walk in. They just shoot them and then they... Well, the door is locked. It's not so clear. Well, they, they, maybe they, 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 you know, they threaten to shoot the guy behind the glass or whatever, and then he unlocks it, or maybe he doesn't and he gets killed, or, or, or the terrorists only start targeting schools that they know they can get in. Mm -hmm. I would say that, all right, so obviously we condemn all the terror attacks and all, all the, you know, the, the, the deaths of, of, of police officers and, and, and you know, people in, in Orlando and other places, but statistically, like, it's the chance of dying in a terrorist attack is it's just incredibly low. We are more likely to die, you know, driving to the, the station or not. Or, and I think that once we we start suspecting each other and then we start you know looking around and, and fearing then they've already won i don't i don't want to live my life in in constant fear i don't want to go i don't want to not go places because i'm afraid of getting caught then they're achieving what they want to achieve and that's paralysis of the american people i don't i don't want to let people you know halfway across the world you know killing each other or a, a bomb going off in in some state here that's not going to shut me down. I hitchhiked across the country last, in, in March, a few months ago. I, was ne I, was, I, I had knives and pepper spray, but I was never worried about somebody actually like killing me. And I, I made it to the end on the West Coast, and nobody had tried to rob me. No one had tried to intimidate me. I had never been attacked. I put my faith in the American people, and they, they restored it. Hmm. Um, I'm just going to give you my face. Sure, uh, please. In, you know, feedback is that it's it, it seems like it's uh, relatively not cognizant of what I think is out there. I mean, I'm, I have grandchildren, I'm warning them every day, that every day I'm with my granddaughter, we're gonna be careful where we go, we're gonna watch, you're not gonna be alone. We're, you know, I mean, I, I don't do the same thing. I don't, I don't look at it as like, it's a place that's just easy going and we're gonna trust in the American people. Well, you should tell her not to be alone. That that's good, but no, I wouldn't say be, terrorism is the greatest threat. I would, there, and that's why this dialogue, by the way, I, I'm, I appreciate that you're strong in your belief of it. Thank I'm you. just not as strong, and and just uh, kind of uh, thrown back a little. I would worry a lot more about terrorism if I lived in the Middle East or in Turkey or in or in Greece or in Germany. But there. There are so few terrorists in America that we know of anyway. I mean, there could be sleeper cells or, or, or something. But if ISIS had the, the, the resources and the people to wage you know, lots of, of attacks, they would have done it already. What are they waiting for? It's unclear to me. <laughs> Tell me what you'd do with immigration policy if you were ever to get to that point. What would your immigration policy be? As, as president or? Um, compared to uh, okay. just as an influencer of uh, immigration policy as compared to Donald Trump, who okay. would suggest that we uh, try to harden our borders as much as possible. Well, we need to, we need to have borders, but deporting everybody in America or you know, all the illegal immigrants, it's absurd. It's, it's, un, it's unconstitutional, it's unrealistic, and it's way too expensive. I would say, you know, if I was the president, I would say that we have a, we'll say a third, third, third plan. And that means one third of these Americans they, who speak English have clean, have clean, you know, criminal records. They might have children in the country that have, have jobs, paying taxes. If they meet most of those circumstances, citizen within two years. Another, another third of those, these are people who don't speak English. They commit crimes or, you know, violent, violent crimes, theft, or crimes that endanger public safety, like drunk driving or something. And they don't have children who are American citizens. They got to go. I'm not saying we got to hunt them down, but when they pop up. They got to go. Another third of these people, maybe they have, they, they speak some English. They they might have a, a child who's American, born here. They might have a job that pays taxes. Maybe it's under the table. We can put them on a pathway to becoming a legal alien, a legal immigrant, and that they, after some time as a legal immigrant, can apply for citizenship and get and get citizenship. Okay, so you've kind of like broken it out. I like that. Well, it's a, it's a it's a complex issue. The circumstances matter, and and you know both sides are they're just. They don't want to think about it. They just want to say, we're going to do it, and this is how it's going to be done. And, and there's, there's no nuance to, some, to, to Donald Trump's immigration policy. 
and the circumstances are a lot more com com are a lot more complex. Okay, let's switch gears completely. Please. Favorite book? Great Gatsby. How so? All right. Well, I love the idea. You know, in some ways, I see myself as Gatsby. Um, but <laughs> share with the audience a little bit about that story, so okay, that you, so, would, so you could place them in the story a little. All right. So, Great Gatsby is it's a book it takes place in the 1920s where this this guy Nick Carraway he goes to uh, to Long Island basically to work in, in the financial market, and then he meets this guy Gatsby who owns this great mansion, lives this great life. Um, but he, he's he's throwing all these parties because you know he he wants to get back with, with you know with with someone from his past and who is living in Long Island with a, a horrible husband and then he's like the he's the ultimate American dream can't you know he, he, he Gatsby grows up in, in North Dakota but he doesn't tell anybody and then he goes in the army and he he spends a little bit of time at Oxford and becomes a a, a sophisticated person but he comes from nothing to try to get everything. Doesn't end up getting ends up getting killed. Spoiler, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. And then it's kind of it's like the, it's like the growth of the American dream, and then it's like the death and the corruption of it. Okay, so that's good. So uh, favorite movie? Star Wars Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> okay, you actually know these right off. Of course, you didn't even of know course. I was going to. I didn't tell you I was going to ask that question. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So tell us why. Okay, so well, I love Star Wars. I loved it since I was a kid. Uh, episode five, it's it's the darkest Star Wars of, of you know of the, the original trilogy, which is the superior trilogy. Um, it's it's directed better. It's it doesn't have to deal with a lot of the exposition that A New Hope does, which is also a great movie. But it's not as campy as, as Return of the Jedi with the Ewoks. So episode you know, episode five, we get the Battle of Hoth, which is amazing. We introduction to Yoda, the first you know real fight, Luke against Vader. Just a, it's a classic all around. It's just a great movie. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to queue up uh, our directors in the other room and ask them if they can uh, put up our any of our um, work that we have to do to uh, give our sponsors up. So, do you have anything for us to share? So let's see. If Hi, it's Gary Lapierre, and the crew wants to thank mm, 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 Maxie's Delicatessen. That's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. They're 781-341-1662. American Cancer Society, yes, they're looking for volunteers, drive cancer patients to and from their treatments. 1-800-ACS-6662. Or just go to www.cancer.org. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry in St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher. That's at 781-341-0611 or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels, just ask for Jessica. You'll find her at 781-344-8882, extension two. Stoughton Penny Saver, our business is advertising your business, they tell us. 27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes in Stoughton. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m., Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m. It's on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. All comments and suggestions welcome. Contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Community Forum Showtimes in Easton. Mondays at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 8 a.m., Wednesdays 3 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. And that too, Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 22. Samaritans, they're at 41 West Street on the fourth floor in Boston, 02111. Their phone number is 617-536-2460. 24-hour helplines for Samaritans, and the number is 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-4673. Samaritans, you can find them at 800-252 that's 252-8336. Or find them online at SamaritansHope.org. And I'd also like to share with our audience that Stoughton's own Farmer's Market is every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2, rain or shine, June 18th through October 1st. It's at the Stoughton Center Church Green, 790 Washington Street. 
We've got all kinds of fresh produce from a couple of different farms. There's breads, there's pastries, there's meats. Always have live music. There's giveaways. We have double SNAP benefits. So if you have SNAP at all, you're going to be able to come in, buy a SNAP ticket, and get double the vegetables. Double is fantastic. It's easy to get parking. We do ask that you don't have pets per the Board of Health. Also, to remind you of Monday Night Bingo, uh, we have a great Ahava Torah congregation at 1179 Central Street in Stoughton. The doors open at 4.30, the games start at 6.30. It's a great time, and they run a great group over there, always contributing to the benefit of the community here in Stoughton. So please, if you like bingo, go down and visit those guys on Monday nights. And we have Stoughton's own cooking show in which are used the most fresh ingredients right from the Stoughton Farmer's Market. There are new episodes coming soon. Check out Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 28. Monday at 5.30, Wednesday at 8 p.m., Thursdays at early in the morning, 9 a.m., and Friday nights at 5 p.m., just in time for you to cook a Friday night dinner. And we're here with John Lott, who's a candidate for the Mass State Senate. His phone number is 857-302-0639. His email is lot2016 at gmail.com, facebook.com slash vote John Lot, and Twitter at Mr. John Lot. And if you like his message, please be willing to share a contribution to his campaign so that he can, you know, wage a good campaign. Uh, other uh, candidates are perhaps much more um, savvy or ahead in terms of their. Uh, campaign strategy. So John will appreciate anything you can do for him. Thank you. And I'm back with John in person here at the studio. So um, we you just brought up your favorite books, your favorite movies, and it, it strikes me that good versus evil is sort of at the root of your, um, your thoughts on this. So tell us about good versus evil. Well, it's definitely my thought, my thoughts on Empire Strikes Back. I, Grey Gatsby is a lot more complex. Um, well, a lot of time, we, you know, we look at an election and we say evil versus evil. I'm picking the lesser even, uh, evil. I don't want to be the lesser evil. I want to be the good candidate. I like all the candidates in the race. Um, so, you know, I don't think any of them are evil. I think we're all good. I want you to vote for the best good, which is me, November 8th. <laughs> so that's a nice twist with that. Uh, a nice set of frames around the issue of good versus evil. Very nicely done. Thank you. Good. I want to bring you back. Uh, you had said after the break, we were gonna, you were going to tell us if you could pick a mentor that, that you would like to pick oh. one now and say, okay, here's somebody that I could either emulate or draw from. Uh, you know, I, I thought about it, you know, during the whole rest of the show and the promotions and all that. Still can't come up with a name. I'm sorry. Even from history? Uh, uh, Cicero. Marcus Tullius Cicero. That's and who I'm going to tell. Tell us why. why okay. What was Cicero doing that, all right. that could encourage you in a certain way? So Cicero is a a famous Roman statesman, politician, perhaps the greatest orator of all time. Um, he was one of the most revered people in the entire Roman Senate, and then he was fighting very hard against Mark Antony and Augustus, the people who would become, or Augustus would become the first emperor of Rome. These are the people who basically, the Republic, the, Republic, the Roman Republic was dying. These are the people who put it down on its knees and cut its head off. Cicero was the guy who was fighting against it. He was fighting so hard. And then Mark Antony sent a slave or some, so he sent someone over and then they cut off his hands and his tongue because, oh, he was, because he was the guy who was standing up against them. Wow. So you want to be someone that, you know, how did you learn to be such a strong stand-up person, I guess? I don't know. I, you know, you, like, the way, that, the way that question is asked, it's like there was one defining moment in my life that you know, changed everything. That, that's, that's not the case, that I don't think it is for most people, that they can, you know, they can point to one, one moment that you know, spra everything sprang from. It's, it's a lot more complex for, than that. And uh, you know, I, don't even, I can't even answer that question myself. <laughs> Tell us your favorite story from childhood. Just to, just to share with the audience something that you remember. Oh, favorites, all these favorites, it makes me have to, you know, narrow them down. Um, favorite story. Yeah, Fav someone's going to get to know you. And say, Tell us, you know, where'd you come from? Oh, favorite story. Um, you know, it's, not, it's not my favorite, because I, 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 I didn't have time to think about this, but 
Um, it's, a, it's a good story. So, no, I'm going to tell a different story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, we used to, my family used to spend, uh, we spent a week every summer at Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. That stopped when I was in like sixth grade. But anyway, we were in the, in the, in the water sometimes. You know, we'd go for cray crayfish or we'd look for, you know, go on the raft and we'd basically have a great time on the beach. And then one time we found this, uh, I found this, it, it was this bizarre creature. It was, it was about this long, and which is about you know eight inches if, if you're at home, and it looked like a pine needle. It was it was brown. It was it's just a thin wire looking thing, and I held it up and it was like, it was going crazy. It was it was alive. I, I didn't even know this was actually. Yeah. So we brought it to this 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 guy, this old guy named Buzz, um, and then because he was like some kind of like you know resident like expert, just like some mm -hmm. wise guy. Um, and I said, like, Buzz, like, we found this, this weird creature. We're like, what is it? He had no idea. We had, we had no idea what this thing was. I showed my parents. They were totally, they were just like, they, they didn't know what this thing was. They probably won't remember that story. But anyway, uh, so probably about two years ago, I'm, I'm just kind of wasting time online, procrastinating something. And then I found, a, it was an article about this, this creature, and it was just like blew my mind. I sent it to my sister. I was like, oh, we found out what, the, what that, little, that, that bug was. <laughs> What was it? Do you remember? I don't. I don't even remember right now, remember. unfortunately. <laughs> All right. So let's close the interview with what are the three most important things that you would like the audience to remember about you? Okay. I'm the only candidate with a comprehensive plan to deal with the opioid epidemic. I'm an independent candidate, so I'm not beholden to any major parties, and I'm the only candidate who's put my my phone number up publicly for my constituents to see, and I'm not going to change that when I get elected. So I want to be the most accessible state senator you've ever had. All right. Well, I want to thank in the background, I've got Leo McGowan and Roy Cohen, Gina Co, and Jackie, who I apologize, didn't learn her last name. Uh, we also have help from Jeff Pickett and Dave Young. And uh, we want to thank you, the audience, for watching. Uh, this is Community Forum, right? We're with John Lott. And John's asking you that please, when you go out to vote on November 8th, Tuesday, that you pick him for state senate. So thank you very much for watching and thank our volunteers for helping us produce this show. My name's Steve Kelly, I've been your host and this and is I'm Community Forum. <laughs>